for all of my questions. Um, <laughs> so I really just kind of wanted to start with Mrs. Allen and your book on the remarkable life of Ronald Reagan. I understand it's a children's book. It has pictures and it kind of covers the entire span of his life. Can you tell us a little bit more? Thank you so much for asking about my book, The Remarkable Ronald Reagan. It, it is a children's book. And people always ask, why did you do a children's book? But believe it or not, if you look at every elementary school across the country, there were no books on Reagan. And wow. so we put together uh, basically his life story. And he came from such humble beginnings and had all sorts of dreams, went on to be a radio announcer, an actor, governor of California, then of course, one of the greatest presidents the United States has ever had. And uh, so we have a lot of his quotes in here and a timeline of his life, but it's been a really a handy book. And I've encouraged people who knew Reagan or lived during that era to write a memo in here for a child, a mm. reflection of what you thought of Reagan and his time as president, because for Ronald Reagan to serve at the time he did, it was almost divine providence, really. Margaret Thatcher, the Pope, and Ronald Reagan all together changed the dynamic worldwide. And so um, it was such an interesting era. And I hope future generations are gonna learn about why Ronald Reagan was so dynamic. And everybody has a story to tell if they were alive during that time. Yeah, and I know we were talking a little bit before the show about would he have been as well received today as he was in his time when he ran and what that would have looked like. You know, Ronald Reagan certainly was a gentleman. Anytime mm -hmm. you had an audience with him, he was just so kind and such a warm, loving person. And uh, we were privileged to see him on several occasions. My husband's family knew him as governor of California. In fact, Ronald Reagan called my husband when George was uh, at UVA and said, hey, will, wow. you, will you chair uh, Reagan for president in 1976, that campaign, which my husband did, it was his first foray into politics on behalf of Reagan, even though my husband really had no interest in politics. He just loved Ronald Reagan. So um, anyway, Reagan was a family friend. He actually appointed my father-in-law to be chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness. And uh, so Coach Allen served in that position and loved you know, uh, presenting barbells to Reagan, including uh, right after Ronald Reagan was shot. There's a great photograph that mm -hmm. is in the Reagan Library of President Reagan lifting up these heavy barbells in spite of the staff telling my father-in-law, do not let him under any condition lift those things out of the box. Mm -hmm. But the president in his jovial manner thought, it's okay, he still had stitches. And oh my gosh. They were like brothers. I mean, it was really fun to see them together. They looked alike and uh, really had a wonderful friendship. And uh, Ronald Reagan loved sports. So that was one of the reasons he followed my father-in-law as a football coach he, he was interested in, in people and mm -hmm. learning about what motivated people. And that's one, one of the things that made Reagan a great leader. He, he read people and he was well read when it came to books. Even as an actor behind stage, he often was found with a book uh, that he was reading on anything from Native Americans to world events, uh, historic novels. I mean, he, he was very well read. That's amazing. I definitely feel like that's that the uniting president we could have definitely used instead of the, the person attempting to unite us now, who I feel like isn't doing a very good job. <laughs> Do you know, I think Ronald Reagan had a, um, a superpower and her name was Nancy. I think sometimes um, people get so caught up in the mystique of Ronald Reagan and he absolutely deserves that. I mean, he motivated an entire world to be better, to try harder um, and really was the probably the very first politician I ever wrote a letter to. You know, I was little, I think I was like seven or eight. And I wrote a letter to him because I heard he liked jelly beans. Um, so, you know, I'm like, dear Mr. President, I like jelly beans too, but not the green ones, you know? So he writes back and he's like, well, I don't really like the green ones either, you know? So we're, we're having this correspondence and um, we had show and tell. So I brought the letter in to show my teacher. And I said, look, Mrs. Bray, it's a letter from the president. And she's like, where did you get this from? I said, from the mailbox. I mean, you know, so she looks at it and she freaks completely out. So everyone in the class has to write a letter now, thanking the president for writing to me. He sends us cases and cases of jelly beans. Oh, that's fun. Amazing. So I spent the better part of a day picking out all the green ones and giving them to other kids because I still don't like the green ones. Um, but it was really cool. And uh, the letter that he wrote to me is my father's most prized possession um, because he wrote it himself. And it says, Dear Coley. Um, and my dad said, you know, 
that's amazing, President. This was shortly after the inauguration. Um, and I'm sure he got letters from kids all over the country. And to have something um, handwritten from President Reagan, it's just such a, a treasure. And we're going to keep it in the family forever and ever. He really did affect our family in, in more ways than one. Um, but being kind and generous and um, physically fit, uh, mentally fit, being aware of your surroundings and, and really being a good American, our whole generation got steeped in that because of Ronald Reagan. What a blessing to the nation. Well, Nicole, Nicole, your story is so amazing, but um, there are lots of stories like that. He did have pen pals all over the world, old and young, mm -hmm. um, but you, you mentioned Nancy, and I think really Ronald Reagan would have given a lot of credit to his mother as well, mm -hmm. because they were very poor. His mom took in sewing to help feed the family and would also take in other families who were having an even rougher time during the oh, Depression. Nice. And uh, that's where Ronald Reagan learned that you you remain humble because you don't know, you know how bad times can be later, and you don't know how bad off your neighbor is. But be kind to your neighbor. His mother made him read the Bible, took he and his brother to church. But they took in African American families, mm -hmm. Caucasian families. Uh, they were living in Illinois. They took in anybody, and you there were stories of the the people that they helped, but. It was his mother who had really the biggest impact on him and mm. teaching him to be kind to others. And of course, Nancy stood by his side and was such a devoted wife and um, very perceptive. And I think Kendall sure. can talk about that too, that you know, a lot of times uh, the role as the spouse of a candidate is to be the eyes and ears for the candidate, but also sometimes to be very perceptive about what, what we may think is occurring if somebody's perhaps taking advantage or trying to mm -hmm. let's see uh, not not share the best interest of the candidates sure. or the, the pub public official so Nancy played a very important role in Ronald Reagan's life and I'm sure Kendall did that for Bob as well well and you did that too Susan you know also Susan kudos to you for preserving this type of history for sure you know, in a time frame where history is really under attack mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic that you're doing that because kids really do need to learn about the presidents and their attributes and how they became president. And I think in particular, his qualities actually would transcend today because he knew how to retort in a very positive way and humorous. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's sort of what, how I connected. I never did meet him. Bob did meet him as a young Republican, uh, but I uh, never met him, but always thought, wow, what a great guy or what a great answer that is or how quick his mind was and how positive he always was. Oh, and as for Nancy, my husband always thought she was the best political wife ever. <laughs> and I, agree. Then, um, I agree. I think that Nancy uh, really, uh, she did more than people realize. I, I was joking the other day because um, addiction and drugs and alcohol are kind of my thing. One of my mm. things that I'm very passionate about and, and you know, people still remember just say no, they make fun of it, mm -hmm. but they still remember it. And there was a discussion the other day on some news program about it. And I thought, see, they're still remembering that and they're still talking about it. And there's still something to say about that when you're talking to your children about the use of illicit drugs or uh, bad behavior, you know, just saying no, just walking away. Those simple thoughts go a long way and she got made fun of but we're still talking about it and yeah I mean, as somebody who works in marketing when you have that that catchphrase that mm -hmm. sticks you know when you have it you have it that reminds me um i was just reading recently about the assistant state's attorney in um baltimore city miss mosby uh, yeah um and her plan not to prosecute uh, what she calls low-level crimes um you know, Mrs. Ehrlich, it, it breaks my heart as someone who's worked for um, an outpatient mental health center during the opioid crisis, when you say that possession is a low level crime and we're just gonna hook them up with some, you know, a counselor or, or, or a local service and prostitution. I mean, that, no. people are it's being actually, trafficked. Most people are forced to, into prostitution, it's trafficking. Yes, and, yes. And, you know, it, it's one thing to say if people are consenting adults prostitution, but most of the time that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, oh, it broke my heart. I just, if that 
thinking continues. First of all, I think state's attorneys should be impeached because they take an oath to uphold the law. They can't just go in and decide what they're going to prosecute and what they're not going to prosecute. And, you know, I've spent years as a prosecutor. I was a defense counsel. Mm -hmm. I was also the more recently in Anne Arundel County, the prosecutor of a drug court uh, mm -hmm. where we really uh, did great work in alternative use. But but those people wouldn't have gotten help if they weren't prosecuted. Right. They were prosecuted for misdemeanor crimes. They, they're, there's a big criterion in how to get to the, into the drug court. Mm -hmm. But had they not been in the system, they would have never gotten the help to get clean. And so that, and, and I know that you also know as a, a mental health professional that this whole marijuana issue hmm. and uh, legalization of marijuana does not take the illegal market away whatsoever. Not at all. But, still have so many people that are out there and then the illegal market will get even more dangerous and more potent. And it's just uh, very unsettling how lawless we are becoming mm -hmm. and how that continues to go uh, without, without much backlash. So I hope there is soon because Baltimore is going to be devastated. Their schools are terrible. There's going to be more flight. That city is going to be in huge trouble as it becomes lawless. It, yeah. It's an amazing thing to me because, you know, as a nation of laws, you know, when you think about um, police officers, our, our police officers are the embodiment of law. And this is why when someone kills one or assaults one as a group, we take that as a personal affront to everyone who, who's born under the cover of our beautiful flag, right? It seems to me that it, the further we get away from respecting those authorities, it's easier to say, well, prostitution's not that bad. And it, you right. know, she was trafficked because she you know, met a guy on Instagram and, and made some poor decisions, but does that cost her the rest of her life? You know, I grew up in the era of officer friendly. You know, they would come to school and say, you know, I'm officer friendly and do your homework and that kind of thing. So the way we presented law enforcement was different, that they were there to help you and, and they were there to make sure that everybody played by the, the rules. Growing up today, when you hear defund the police, um, the police are not your friend, they're out to get you, they're out to kill you. It makes me sad for this generation. Yeah, I mean, what will they believe in? We had to do, um, you know, we were talking again before the show about some of us had to go through what I call like woke training mm -hmm. after the George Floyd incident. And my company was no exception. And they made us go through this whole basically white guilt thing. And then they phrased the question. They, everyone had to answer the question, what keeps you up at night? And my answer was, what keeps me up at night is the idea of a world without police. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. yeah, that, like that's what keeps me up at night. Not whatever this other, you know, race baiting stuff they were trying to go for that is truly what scares me and and nicole on your on your topic of prostitution as well and these girls being able to get help one of the biggest issues that president that the trump administration was working on is was you know human trafficking mm -hmm. and a lot of women who are who are, are are in prostitution they don't choose that some of them are forced into it yeah well you and, think and baltimore is a hub for a lot of things including drugs and prostitution um, and it's a gateway because of its access to, to I-95 of trafficking heroin for certain, um, as well as people. So I, I think it's- The series Dope opens up on the Baltimore series and says Baltimore is the heroin capital of the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, you know our great congressional candidate, uh, her name is escaping me, it'll come to me, uh, had that fabulous commercial showing the real yeah. Baltimore. Kim Klasek. Uh, Kim Klasek. And, yeah, Kim, thank you. And she, Kim Klasek, and she, it was, it was the truth right there on camera. And uh, we can't deny that. And it's only going to get worse. I am slightly optimistic. Unfortunately, I think there will be a backlash to this. I hope certainly for the 2022 elections, mm -hmm. because I think crime's going to get a lot worse. I mean, this is a slippery slope. Now you had you have uh, Marilyn Mosby saying she's not going to prosecute. Of course, you have the California um, prosecutor that, uh, you know, the other prosecutors are all leaving the office. They actually sued him. I think it's that that's getting to a terrible situation because he, too, is not prosecuting certain types of cases. And um, I think that there's going to be a big backlash, or at least maybe I'm being hopeful that there will be, because a lot of people are going to get injured, hurt, killed. Did you see that video yesterday of Washington DC and, and the yeah. um, carjacking? Yeah. I mean, it's so unsettling to watch something like that. I mean, that's someone's father 
and uh, husbands and, you know, the killing of innocent people and that, and that those two girls could have cared less. Mm -hmm. The one is says uh, is worried about their phone. I mean, what's so worrisome is how we have a generation who uh, is so harsh on humanity and could care less about humanity, their, their fellow human. Mm -hmm. Very, very unsettling. Makes you question, you know, how bad do things need to get under democratic leadership before people are who typically in very blue areas are willing to, let's say, hmm, maybe we should give the other side a chance. Well, I, I have a theory about that. And so my theory is, is that to an extent, they need things to be bad. They need things to be bad. So people buy that rhetoric, you know, that that Republicans are the bad guy, we're the man that's trying to keep them down and you know, that kind of thing. And I think there are candidates in Baltimore City, um, Giovanni Patterson being one of them, who is fighting so hard to dispel that myth. He's actually starting a petition to make sure that Baltimore City School Board is not appointed, but elected. Uh -huh. So we're working on that because that changes a lot of things. That changes a lot of things for a lot of people. And although, you know, if I had the money and the, and the time, I would want to go out and personally save everyone. But if we can at least start with this next generation of children, we can look very much forward to a brighter day um, if we can kind of turn the tide with them. You know, we were, we were talking about hopefully the dynamic changing when it comes to elections. And Kendall, towards the end of the last the, the recent presidential race, I was part of a national coalition on Moms for Safe Neighborhoods because we really felt like if we could trigger women to vote, for safe community, uh -huh. what, what mom doesn't want to leave their house and know that their kids are off going somewhere safe to school, their parents are taken care of somewhere safely, their right. job is in a secure place. So safety becomes a really huge issue. And your point was very well stated, crime is going to increase yeah. when drugs are involved and, and all the other issues. And we're seeing that in Virginia and the Democrat control in Virginia is allowing everything to backslide to what it was like in the 70s and 80s before right. George came in with a very law and order platform, mm -hmm. a very, very, very strong, but they're trying to undo all of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they're doing it quickly. And so I, I do think there will be a backlash. Watch Virginia this year in our uh, gubernatorial race and see if uh, hopefully the Republican candidates, uh, our nomination will be over May 8th and we'll have a strong candidate. And uh, I bet the Republican will come across as the strongest law and order candidate uh, versus the Democrat. And I think that's an issue that will continue to win. And especially for women, uh, for sure. want to vote for safety and uh, at, in all aspects of their life. And, and it's going to play everywhere. But these cities have to watch out because there is a huge movement to flee the cities. Uh, after after the lockdowns, but then with the crime because the shutdowns and everything else. Yeah. And those cities have had Democratic control forever. Forever. There, forever. Has, there hasn't been a Republican in sight in Baltimore, mm -hmm. in in Chicago, in fill in the blank, Philadelphia, right. and and really people need to take hold if they want to preserve these cities. They really need to do that. I mean, D.C. and New York as commuter cities may be changed forever. I, I mean, agree. to walk in D.C. is just depressing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I worked there uh, the last last two years and the hustle and bustle is part of the attraction for me. And it is gone and it is it's just frightening. It's really um, I, I was going in just a little bit during the summer. It was really me and the homeless in Union Station. Yeah. Um, and so it was. But all those little shops that were along those areas that fed those buildings, now there's no one there. I don't, you know, I just don't see it coming back to what it was completely. And I, I can't believe New York is the same way where you have these big commuter cities of a huge influx of people coming in and then leaving. Well, I think we're living, in, unfortunately, in a tale of two Americas, you know, and, and it's getting more and more stark, more and more grave. You know, which America do you want to live in? Um, here in Charles County, where I live, um, we have a tremendous influx of women from the city, um, professional women, most of whom work for the federal government. Um, they're very well educated. So our rate of our level of education countywide has increased from high school graduate, maybe an associate's degree to master's degrees, you know. Um, but the problem is, is most of these women are single and they have children, not small children, like teenager children. So our crime rate has gone up. 
I mean, things that we've never seen happen in our community are happening now. And our sheriff, God bless him, he's doing all that he can to kind of stay ahead of the trend. But culturally, it's very different when they move here. Um, I had one woman ask, you know, what, what do you guys do? So uh, I said, well, you know, we get up in the morning, we go kayaking, go to yeah, the farm, that's say, food. Or you know. you're near the water. That's a right. big plus. Well, I said the county produces a whole magazine. It's called The Guide, right? We learn how to play pickleball. You know, there are a lot of things that you can do, but none of them are like what you, you're used to, right? Right. So there's going to be a, a little bit of assimilation that's going to have to occur. But rather than assimilate, they want to change Charles into what they're used to. So there's a big push for a 24 hour basketball court because that's important. Um, you know, where I live on the west side of county, we roll up the rug real tight about nine o'clock and we keep it that way until about 4.15 when everybody's getting up to go, you know, make that trip into DC and go to work. It is a very interesting dynamic because you see the power of these women. You know, they've worked hard, you know, they've climbed the ladder and now they're here. Uh -huh. And it takes them an hour and a half to get to work and an hour and a half to get home. So that makes their teenager at home for a good four hours unattended. Mm -hmm. and, and so much trouble can happen. And, it, and it's not a slight on those kids. But if you didn't grow up in this community and, you know, you don't swim, you don't like water sports, you know, you're not a country kid, um, you know, you're afraid of guns so, you know, and traps and all the kind of things that our kids like to do, horseback riding. They have no desire to do that. So I see that they're bored. You know, they hang around at the mall and hang around at the mall and, you know, hang around at the mall. And but they, that, it was a choice of theirs to move to Charles County, allegedly for the lifestyle, correct? This is why their parents, their mother moved here because it's safe and, and right. it's, it was safe. But now we have such an influx and um, the, the county is just growing by leaps and bounds, kind of bursting at the seams to a point where even the new people are saying, oh, no, no more houses. We can't take any more. The problem is, is we don't have enough economic development, jobs wise, business wise to sustain us. So we have to continue to build houses and live off of the property taxes, which is unfortunate. Um, so we're. Uh, I don't want to get you off, though. No, you're fine. Well, you were talking about powerful women. One of the biggest trends we've seen this year is the increase of women who are getting elected to office, particularly Republican women. You know, we talked about the importance of, you know, behind every strong male candidate is a strong woman, whether that be their mother or their wife or both in the case of Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. But what about these strong female candidates that we've seen? And it really is an inspiration. You know, we're seeing it at the national level we're going through a lot of municipal races in, in Maryland this year is how do we inspire more Republican women to get involved and to run for office? And I think, you know, Kendall, I think you'd be a really good person to bring into that for Maryland in particular. Yeah, you know, it's so important. Bob and I have been talking uh, with folks in the party about how important it is to have great candidates. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, at least, you know, in my county and in our state, I think that Maryland still has more women in the legislature than any other state. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in our county, women really do vote for women. There's no question about it. If you are a female uh, judicial candidate, you're, you're golden. And in a lot of other respects, that's the case. And so I, I applaud that. I think it's great. I think anytime you're, you're gonna be elected, you, you need your family to be on board. You know, I was always that, you know, Bob and I were very fortunate. Uh, we were, uh, Newlywed, I think. Um, I, is that somebody's dog? <laughs> Not mine for once. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> uh, but at, at any rate, um, well, let's have the dog run. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's important to have your family really on board. But I think I think there's ways to do that. And I think if you set a tone from the beginning, uh, Susan, you would probably agree with this. Your husband set that tone from the beginning that no one was going to mess with you, right? <laughs> and and the same thing with with. Uh, with my husband. So, you know, staff knew that we were number one priority. Uh, we were involved. I was certainly involved politically, not as much on policy, but very political. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what in the governor's race in Maryland, I mean, we had no bench at all. So I had to be involved in, mm -hmm. in that in a, in a high, high level way mm -hmm. in order to get the message out and to reach as many people as we could. So in Maryland, um, you know, you need the family involvement because we don't, we don't have enough. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough people uh, fighting and we need to convince a few folks, as you know. So um, I think that I encourage 
I, I, we need good candidates now more than ever. But again, I do sense a tide turning mm -hmm. uh, with issues like safety, uh, with issues, wait till the taxes hit, with so many of these other issues that are coming down the pike. We're going to actually have things to compare now that the Republicans are out on the, of the national scene. So when we are able to do that, I think we're going to be able to turn some tides. But I, I feel very strongly that you got to bring your family with you, make them part of the team. Kids love it. I, you know, I know that one of my boys is probably headed toward uh, running at some point in his life. He, he's got the bug. And I'm still very positive about that. You know, okay. I think that politicians, most of them are good. They get in for good intentions. I think it's a really rough game now with social media, but all of us have to be aware that wherever we go and whatever we do is recorded like today. Uh, and, you know, we're going to be held to what we say. Hmm. So if you're confident and you have something to say and you have some changes to make, it's time to go for it. Well, I'm going to follow up with you if you're saying you have a son who wants to get involved because I know that our Anne Arundel YR is- Oh, honey, it ain't going to be a Maryland. <laughs> That's okay. I'll get him involved anyway. I'll find a way. Um, but Susan- We're, we're heading south. <laughs> <laughs> but Susan, you were telling us earlier also that you worked with women, whether that be because they wanted to run themselves or if they had a family member who was running. So you can definitely add a lot more to, to what Kendall was saying. Well, you know, I-, I Kendall and I uh, were very fortunate that we had spouses in public life who did make sure that the staff and everybody knew that we were a team. Right. And that, that tone truly was set from the beginning. And so I do try to counsel other candidates' families to do that because, first of all, if you're lucky enough to be elected, you're sitting in a moment in history that you will not pass through again and you have the opportunity to do things and change change things and improve things for your fellow citizens. So that's a really, really fortunate place to be. Um, and, and who wouldn't want that? But I, I think there are some times reluctance, uh, you know, on the part of family members um, who may, may be shy or have other reasons that they don't want to be in public life. And I can understand that too. And there are things that they can do without having to put themselves out there. Right. They can certainly blog or just be in photos or whatever. So there, there are ways that people can be involved, but certainly the home precinct counts a whole lot for any candidate. You were talking about women running. Uh, we did, I was one of the founders of the Jennifer Byler Institute, which was founded by the Republican Party in Virginia to really educate women to be candidates, but also to be a part of a campaign in any aspect, whether that's fundraising, media, uh, research, because not everybody's meant to be a candidate. And we need, mm -hmm. we need the thought process of women working with candidates as much as we need women to be candidates because we might see things a little bit differently. If you're talking about gun control, we might phrase it a little differently than mm -hmm. a male candidate and they need to hear from a female. So we, we tried to train women in all aspects of campaigning and it was a very successful program. We, we had a huge number of women go through it for about 10 years and then the party kind of ran out of money and interest and it kind of went by the wayside. I'm not, uh, I, I think we could probably set it up again. Mm -hmm. um, and there has always been different groups trying to scramble on you know, teaching campaign schools and that type of thing. But really most candidates learn as they are a candidate. You know, they, there's some things that you can't really teach. You, right, Kendall? You don't know it until you're walking in those shoes and mm -hmm. dealing with the press every day and waking up to whatever is happening on TV and the dynamics of your campaign changing and shifting based on world events or local events. So you have to be flexible, be prepared. And I have to say, I give my mom a lot of credit for teaching me as a military wife. Uh, my mom really held everything together and always taught us that we were part of the team. Dad had to go to Vietnam twice. He was a pilot. We would sit at the table at night and watch our little TV to see if his squadron had been shot down. So there were life-threatening situations we dealt with, but my mom is the one who taught us. We say our prayers, we hold hands, we stick together, we're a team. Wherever dad is, we're a team. And that's what I tried to instill in our children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, every, every walk of life, uh, they have ups and downs, they have trials and tribulations, but as a family, if you can stick together, 
but everybody tends to be a little more successful. And I do think we'll see more women running. We had a record number winning as Republicans this year in Congress. We have some great women who, who uh, won, uh, Congresswoman Mace of South Carolina. She's mm -hmm. outstanding. She was one of the first females to go through the Citadel. Uh, her voice, her new voice in Congress is really powerful. Uh, we had women from New Mexico, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, really, I think, elevate the voice of conservative women in the halls of Congress, and it'll be great to watch them. I would, would like to say one other thing, though. My husband twice ran against a woman, first for Congress, and um, I used to say, don't make me vote on gender, make me vote on issues and ideas. Yeah. Yes. He, he mm -hmm. won that race, and then he, won, he ran against a woman and won for governor as well. So while I applaud women getting involved in politics and wanting to serve, I want the right women to serve. Absolutely. So yes. I think that little caveat's kind of important too. <laughs> I, I completely agree. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing when you see Republican women winning. Um, and as a Republican woman, I think, well, if she can do it, you know, hold my beer, bro, I'm in, right? <laughs> so I, I, I literally, you know, it's how I made my way onto the Central Committee. A dear friend of mine, um, and he's a new um, judge of the Orphans Court, Bill Dotson, called me during hockey season. I'm sitting on the sofa. He says, listen, kid, I need you to run for Central Committee. I said, sure, I'm in. You know, I'll go over the next day, pay $25. Next thing you know, I'm a chairman. Um, and it's just been a snowball effect since then. But I really feel like there are such strong women behind the scenes, especially at MDGOP, Jackie being one of them, Maria Sophia, um, Nicolae Ambrose. We have such strong women who I think our party chair values our opinion. Dirk really listens to, to the things that we have to say and what we bring to the table. And I think that makes us feel empowered. Like it makes me want to run for something. It kind of says, well, listen, if, if I can sell this to this party chairman, who's also an attorney, who's also a father, who's also a husband, you know, um, I'm thinking that maybe, you know, I'll go over and get myself some classes and see, you know, policy point wise where I match up and, and what I can do to help benefit um, traditional values and conservative values across the state. And I think that plays a large part of it, giving us a chance to at least be heard. Um, I think women have some tremendous ideas politically that are not that far off, um, as Mrs. Allen said, from the men. It's just the way that we present it. I think, you know, we filter language differently than they do. And sometimes that filter pays off in spades. You I, have that lady's touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just to, just to add a couple of things, Bob would not have been elected without the Maryland Federation of Women. Mm -hmm. Seriously, we had more of those workers out there on any given day, on any event, always showing up, always getting people there. So those women behind the scenes are, are you're correct, Susan, so important. It's mm -hmm. just unbelievable. And that's a great way to help without actually being out front. And the, and the other thing is, we learned through COVID that down ballot is really important. Oh, that local it? school board, this time around, I am looking up what they think, mm -hmm. because when we're in this situation again and they get the power, we can argue whether they should have had it or not, because I'm not so sure they should have. I think mm -hmm. things should have been settled higher up. But at any rate, you know, here we go. Your local school board who you vote for, who you never pay attention to and you just, oh, OK, you know, and, and, and it's both sides of the aisle. you got to know who what the Republicans are thinking, too. There were a couple of uh, eight to nothing votes in our school board. And I'm like, what? What's going on here? So down ballot, make sure you know who's, who's saying what and what they think as well, because it's become very important. Every right. election is important. Vote in your municipal year. Like, I know most Marylanders aren't going to go out and vote this year, but there are a ton, we had over 300 municipal elections this year. Go vote in mm -hmm. them. We're still, we're still working. We have a subcommittee that's, that's kind of working hard on on these municipal elections. Um, and I can tell you, it is it is a labor of love. People right. think it's an off year. And I'm like, it's not an off year. And these- There's no such you know, thing as an off year in politics. And politics are, you know, certain things are so local. And I agree, Mrs. Ehrlich, when you think about what we've lived through during COVID, if that hasn't convinced you that your town officials are, you know, very, very powerful, nothing will. I mean, 
from from the the early days of of the quarantine, you know, when county councils had to get together and decide what was going to be open and what wasn't going to be open and how we were going to move forward, you know, these were people for the most part who really had no pressure before. And right. so you did see the chinks in the armor, the cracks and, and and all of those kind of things and it makes you think, wait, did I vote for that person? You know, here in Charles, you got a, a long list and you just pick the first five or six, you know, and hope for the best with your fingers crossed. I think we <laughs> owe it to ourselves to be much more informed yeah. than that. Um, and and party, party wise, um, we're all about informing people and making sure people know that this is not an off year. We need you to actually get out and vote. Getting out the vote in the quote unquote off year has been um, difficult, but we're winning. We're, we're winning and it's a good thing. And, and we hope to continue that winning streak that we have going on now with the local elections. That way we can have an army trained up for 2022, um, which I think we're going to need, but I think we'll do well. I, I really do. I think we're going to turn some important corners in the state. Um, I'm very hopeful for 2022. Well, we can, we can use anybody who thinks it's an off year in Maryland to come across the border in Virginia and help <laughs> us with our really, really important governor's race, the Senate sure. governor, attorney general. I mean, those races- I know the YRs will be there. You guys have a couple of deployments coming your way. Awesome. We will count on that, Jackie. I hope you can round up as many as possible. And um, we're going to need everybody because, you know, Virginia has been slipping. And George always says, gosh, if Maryland can elect a Republican governor, what is wrong with Virginia? You know, how, <laughs> how, how can we be this far off? But boy, do they have a stranglehold on things in uh, Richmond. So we're going to need your help this year. We'll come help. The BRC will definitely come help. We're, we're energized politically now. Um, most of our, our members live in and around Baltimore County, Baltimore City. And so being political, politically active and learning to, to canvas door to door and do text messaging and phone banking, it's all kind of new to them. So it's very exciting. You know, <laughs> they're like, this is great. And I'm like, great, I've got thousands of other doors. Let's go, you know. So I think it's going to be a wonderful time um, again to get that training that we need to move into 2022 as an army. I believe that keeping our region or getting our region red is great for everybody. I mean, it works out well for everyone when traditional values win the day. Um, we've had enough of this progressive nonsense. It's getting worse um, every day. Um, and I think, as Mrs. Ehrlich said, we're reaching a saturation point. Um, but I fear how much longer we have to live through it. Right. You yep. know, and well, we at least have the two year, two yeah. years we've got to make through and yeah. uh, uh, I guess Senator Manchin is the most powerful human being in the world, and hopefully he'll he'll vote vote the right way when it comes around. And uh, well, so it's a coincidence that the Biden administration suddenly found a position for his wife. Yeah. Well, let's what just hope that that doesn't influence him the wrong way, uh, and that uh, he holds his own. So. Well, we're coming up in the last few minutes in the show, so we'd like to take the last few minutes to give each of you a chance to plug whatever you want to plug. I know both of you are working on the podcast game now, and you know, you know Susan, you got a chance to plug your book. So, whatever you guys want, uh, you know, where can we find your book? Where can we buy it? So, uh, Susan, we'll start with you. Well, I'll, I'll go back to the book just because I love Ronald Reagan. I want every everybody to know about him, the remarkable Ronald Reagan. You can find it on Amazon. Um, or Young America's Foundation. They certainly have uh, purchased lots of them. They are the ones that are sending speakers, conservative speakers to college campuses and having high school conferences around the country to make sure that Reagan's legacy lasts and that young people come up knowing about uh, Reagan. So Young America's Foundation is helping with the book as well. But um, thank you for allowing me to talk about uh, the remarkable Ronald Reagan because he was. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And, and I know that we have an upcoming uh, conversation coming up with Yaf and um, you guys husbands on April 21st, and that's going to be on cancel culture and free speech on college campuses. Mm -hmm. Definitely looking forward to that. And Kendall, what about you? Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say, Susan, it's so good to see you. Um, our husbands are fast and furious friends. I love that Dwight's gotten them together. It's just such a <laughs> Dwight thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, he's so much fun. And, and uh, it seems like our guys are having a lot of fun. The governors are having a lot of fun getting together and talking. And I also think it's important. They did great jobs in their state and we can learn a lot from them no matter 
how long they've been out of office or what they're doing now. And I think uh, I really appreciate that, believe me. Um, I think it's important to preserve all types of history and kudos on the book for Ronald Reagan. Again, preserving history is really important. So thank you. It's so great to see you. What an asset you've been to that state. And um, I, I'll just say that we're doing a podcast. You know, Bob and I did the radio together for many years. We got fired from that, but uh, it, we love that. And so uh, moving into the future podcast, I kind of miss the people calling in directly, but at, at any rate, we're, we're really having fun. Bottom line with Bob and Kendall Ehrlich on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So it's been uh, fun and, uh, you know, who knows, but we'll be out there fighting with you guys and continue the fight and continue for Republican values. And I believe that we're gonna win that fight actually mm -hmm. in the long I run. I just think it's a, it's a rough time right now, but we're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And I love uh, Jackie and Nicole that you are the young new blood that's coming out and fighting hard. So thank you. You're yeah. doing a great job. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And yeah. Kendall, I know your husband also has a new book coming out. Is it out already? Can people buy it? Yeah, it's not quite out. And um, you're catching me off guard on our title. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm his biggest fan with his writing. It's so funny. When uh, he was governor, I would always tell people, if you've got an issue, write it down. Write it to him. He's a writer and a reader. If you want me to deal with it, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have a, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have a book club for um, the Maryland Black Republican Council, and Turning Point is one of the books that we are reading next month. Oh, great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I see, yeah. I think we started out with Turn This Car Around. Turning Point is <laughs> the most recent, and then the new one is coming out in June, I believe. I'll because learn. of publishing right now, a lot of books are coming out in paperback first. I mean, it'll be a oh. beach read. It'll be perfect. Yeah, it'll yeah. be a beach read, exactly, mm. but you'll be notified certainly uh we can't on the, wait on the podcast and we'll definitely announce it here and you know uh nicole my very special co-host do you have anything you would like to plug i have one thing and um it happens on april 8th it is the rosenwald school documentary um we have partnered with the frederick douglas foundation and um, Metro Conservative Media is also a sponsor. Um, and this is a documentary that talks about the Rosenwald schools, the schools that uh, Mr. Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington built across the United States. There were over 5,000 of them, more than 150 of them here in Maryland. One is still standing. It is the Freetown School. It's in Glen Burnie. And we will have a um, select group of people there because of COVID, we can't really fill the center. But the rest of us will be on a Zoom call and I cordially invite you all to take part. It's gonna be a fascinating evening. There are graduates from the school who wanna speak and tell us about their experiences at these schools and why it played such an important part in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at BRC, we are big proponents of school choice and we absolutely believe the, the tax dollars should follow the student. Mm -hmm. And so this is an opening salvo to a, a much longer town hall legislative push to make sure that Maryland understands that, you know, not all kids need to sit into a, in a classroom with a unionized teacher, you know, learning a curriculum not built for them. So we're, we're hopeful for that. It's going to be at seven o'clock on April the 8th. And um, we've, we're going to have, I think, 20 or 30 people at the actual school. The reason why we can't have more is they don't have internet, um, which is shameful. You know, it's 2021 and they use the school as a community center and they simply cannot afford Wi-Fi. So this is a problem for us. So we guaranteed them today that we'd go out and do some fun fundraising to get them at least a couple of years of internet um, so that they can kind of be on par with the other um, community centers in the area. But we look forward to seeing you guys on April 8th for the Rosenwald School documentary. It should be a hoot. That sounds amazing. And uh, really amazing. School choice is so important right mm -hmm. now. Look at the Baltimore City School System. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. 45 just did a special on it. It's so depressing. Those kids are just, uh, just, uh, there's no way to get out of poverty for them nope. in, in those schools. There's just no path out and it's, it's just terrible. So kudos on bringing the light to uh, that great idea that the tax dollars should follow the student. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. It's only fair. You know, when you, it is when you only fair, it. yeah, it's only fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you ladies so much. We're definitely gonna have to have this on again. I, I guarantee you, I know we had some tech issues, but when this goes live, I'm sure it's going to blow up. Everyone's going to watch. Everyone's going to love it. And they're going to request you guys to come back. But for now, we'll be saying goodbye to our lovely ladies. The gentlemen we bet will be back next week. Actually, Governor Allen will be co-hosting and we'll be having Dr. Jeremy Ackerman on to discuss the vaccine rollout. And I know later in April, we have Scott Walker coming on to talk about cancel culture. That's going to be exciting. So a lot of amazing programming coming on to Direct Line. We're really kicking things up this year, but uh, we will see you next week. And thank you guys for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jackie. Congrats to you all. <laughs> okay, we're cleared. Yeah. Are we still recording? I think it still says recording. Yeah, it's still yeah I need to stop that. We're going to do the, if you guys uh, 